Welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. Last season, we discussed the various parables of Jesus, their meaning, implications, and we analyzed them through the context of the times and culture they were written in. This season, a special request, we'll be discussing the early councils of the church and how doctrine developed in those early times. Officially, there have been 21 ecumenical councils in church history, but I think the first 10 will be enough for this season. However, before we start examining those, let's begin with the prototype of the councils that would follow, the Council at Jerusalem. The Council at Jerusalem wasn't actually an ecumenical council in the sense that the others were, a gathering of bishops from all over the world, because at the time it took place, only a very small number of churches in individual cities existed. But it's the only council described in the Bible itself, and it set the tone for everything that would follow afterwards. One common thread among all the early councils of the church, and most of the later ones too, is that they'd be called in response to some dilemma about the faith that needed resolving, and the council at Jerusalem was no exception. And some, coming down from Judea, taught the brethren that except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had no small contest with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of the other side should go up to the apostles and priests to Jerusalem about this question. Acts 15, 1-2 Those people that the Bible says were coming down from Judea were a group that we now call the Judaizers. They were Christians, they believed in Jesus, but they also believed in continuing to adhere to the old law of Moses in a lot of different ways, with the most pronounced and divisive one being circumcision. As we just saw, the Judaizers believed that you couldn't be saved without being circumcised in the way that Moses described. Paul and Barnabas didn't teach the Judaizer position, however, so the Judaizers kept following them from town to town trying to undermine their teachings. Something obviously had to be done about it, so Paul and the others appealed to the apostles for a final judgment about the circumcision issue. That was why they decided to gather in Jerusalem. And the apostles and ancients assembled to consider of this matter. Acts 15, 6. The appointees of Jesus, what we now call bishops, spent time thinking about the issue and hearing both sides give their defense. In the same way, later councils would also involve bishops contemplating matters of doctrine carefully. And when there had been much disputing, Peter, rising up, said to them, Men, brethren, you know that in former days God made choice among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knoweth the hearts, gave testimony, giving unto them the Holy Ghost, as well as to us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Acts 15, 7-9 Ultimately, however, after a lot of discussion had been had, Peter stood up and started explaining his reasons for thinking the way he did about the issue. Now, therefore... Why tempt you, God, to put a yoke upon the necks of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Acts 15.10 Peter asks what the point is in burdening people with a requirement like circumcision which the Jews haven't been able to deal with in the past. But by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we believe to be saved, in like manner as they also. Acts 15.11 Peter points out that they're not saved by circumcision, they're saved by the grace of God, and that grace can save people whether they're circumcised or not. And all the multitude held their peace, and they heard Barnabas and Paul telling what great signs and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Acts 15.12 Once Peter has made his position clear, none of the others argue against it. However, there is someone who tries to expand on it. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men, brethren, hear me. Simon hath related how God first visited to take of the Gentiles a people to his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After these things I will return, and will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen down, and the ruins thereof I will rebuild, and I will set it up, that the residue of men may seek after the Lord and all nations upon whom my name is invoked, saith the Lord, who doth these things. To the Lord was his own work known from the beginning of the world, from which cause I judge that they, who from among the Gentiles are converted to God, are not to be disquieted. 
Acts 15, 13-19. James argues that they definitely shouldn't be bothering non-Jewish converts with these kinds of circumcision demands, and gives some more reasons why not. But that we write unto them that they refrain themselves from the pollutions of idols, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him in the synagogues, where he is read every Sabbath. Acts 15, 20-21 Finally, James explains that there are some basic aspects of the Mosaic Law that people should still follow, like not eating meat sacrificed to idols, drinking blood, eating strangled animals, and having sex outside of marriage, but that some of these rules should be followed mainly to avoid leading other people astray, because the Law of Moses is so well known, and at the time was read from every week. In this way, the Judaizer position was ruled incorrect, and Paul and Barnabas were vindicated. This is also the way future issues would be resolved in the church as well for a very long time. Careful thought and discussion among the bishops, then a final ruling, usually involving the successor of St. Peter in some manner, the Bishop of Rome, and some explanations of why in the final text written down by the council, or in this case by St. Luke, who wrote the Acts of the Apostles. Next, the First Council of Nicaea. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.